went to Thessalonica, there must not have been any Christians there. I mean, he's first missionary there coming with the gospel. Uh, there would have been people who believed in God, and there would have been Jewish people who you know, didn't even know that the gospel had, had come. Uh, but as his, I can't remember the word the want was, as it, his habit was, he went to the synagogue. And if I understand it right, when a visiting preacher came, they'd say, you got anything to say? And off he went. And for three weeks, he, was, he, would, he told them about the gospel in the synagogue. And the Bible says that, uh, let, me, let me read it here, some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. Yeah, what a blessing. Here, here he's preaching the gospel and some of them believe. And of course, uh, some of them didn't. And uh, he, he, they saw a church started. They, they saw things uh, going on. And you know, we don't, don't know a lot about uh, you know, what kind of building they met in, if they met in a building, what kind of programs they had, how many people were there. Uh, but we do know from the, the books of Thess Thessalonians that they had a good testimony. Uh, there were people that had a, a testimony in their own city and, and around about uh, that they loved the Lord and, and were faithful to the Lord. And we've, we've been looking, we started last week looking at their testimony, and it, it's a good um, recommendation to us as to what we should strive to be like and a good pattern for our, our church to follow. One of the things we saw, it was, it was a saved church. It sounds funny to say that, but... Uh, this was a church, people knew they were saved, you know. Uh, they knew they were saved, and other people knew they were saved. Uh, they had a testimony, uh, they had an assurance in their own hearts. Uh, they'd been changed by the Word of God. Uh, you know, one of the main ways Satan destroys the work of God is he gets lost people doing it. You know, there's plenty of religion around the world. If you want religion, Satan's in the religion business. But what we need are saved churches, <laughs> saved individuals who band together and, and believe the, the Word of God. And uh, so because they were truly saved, uh, they also valued the Scriptures. It was a scriptural church. Uh, they had a, a real reverence uh, for the Word of God. Uh, and, you know, it's the Holy Spirit's tool to, to change us it is the Word of God. Uh, that's what God uses in our lives and used in, in their lives. In uh, chapter 2, verse 13, Paul makes the comment, uh, when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. It works. It works. <laughs> the problem is, too often we hear the word of men, don't we? Uh, you know, my opinions make no difference in, in eternity, really. It, neither do yours, by the way. But the word of God stands forever. We, we need to be a scriptural church. We need to be a saved church. We need to be a scriptural church. God's word is important. Thirdly, it was a spirit-filled church. They, uh, in, uh, let's see, what is it here? In verse 6, they received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Now, that's when you know a person really has joy is when it's in spite of what's going on, not because of what's going on. Really, if, it's, if, it's, if you have I'll use the word joy, because of good things going on. That could just be happiness. You can get that about anywhere <laughs> if everything's going right. But real joy, man, it's not dependent on, on your situation. And uh, that's a fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. Some of you are going through some things. Don't, don't believe Satan's lie that you can't have God's peace if your situation isn't peaceful. God can give you the fruit of His Spirit. God is working on the, the fruit of your Spirit, the fruit of His Spirit in your life. Uh, get, get my prepositions right there. Uh, no matter what our circumstances are. And that's what this church was like. You know, when Paul came to Thessalonica, he'd just come from Philippi. And, and you read there in Acts, he said, no, it, it's actually in, in 1 Thessalonians 2, um, verse 2. After that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God. You know, he'd had a terrible time at Philippi, but people got saved and the church started. And he went from there to Thessalonica, and persecution came, and, and they chased him out of that town. But people got saved, and, and, and a church was started. And, you know, in, in our, our distress, 
if we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit. And God can, I mean, he can use that in any situation. He, can, he doesn't leave us or forsake us. Um, fourthly, because they were saved and scriptural and spirit-filled, they were a surrendered church. This is all review from last week. I'm sorry if, if it's repetitious to you, but, you know, we have a natural rebellion, don't we? When, when we're in, the, in our natural state, we want to go our own way. We don't want people telling us what to do. But when you've, you're saved and spirit-filled and surrendered, you're, you're wanting to be like Jesus. You're wanting God to direct you. And uh, that's the way they were. That was their goal. And the Bible tells us there in chapter 2, verse 12, that's the only worthy walk, really, that you walk worthy of God, uh, that we be like Jesus. Uh, it wasn't that there weren't any problems in their church or any problem people. But we're, we're talking their general thrust of things is these were people who were surrendered uh, to God's will. You know, it's so important for us to make sure that there's not areas of rebellion. I don't know much about battle or anything like that, but you, you read about how sometimes when there's a battle, there's pockets that they've got to deal with. You, you know, there's a group of enemy soldiers here or, or there's a, you know, missiles over here or whatever. Well, in our own hearts and lives, we need to make sure there's not pockets of rebellion against the Lord. And we can excuse them, we can, we can justify them, we can, you know, ignore them, but we won't be right with God when there's pockets of resistance. Uh, we need to be completely uh, yielded to God's will. Well, if you are, if you're saved and scriptural and spirit-filled and surrendered, uh, then let's get to the next point. This was a suffering church. <laughs> if you're going to follow the Lord, you can pretty well mark it down. In fact, God has said it. Uh, there's going to be some resistance that you're going to encounter. In chapter, in, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, um, "...ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost." Folks, the gospel offends some people. Have you experienced that? You, you try to just share the, the word with people. Some people are offended at everybody. It's, you know, the, the, they're not just offended at the gospel. But if you actually get the chance to talk to people, sometimes it'll be a family member. Sometimes it'll be a, a dear friend. Uh, sometimes it'll be you know, others, strangers, and, and so on. But you, you try to share the gospel with them. Uh, I, the other day, oh, I've been a few weeks ago now, I just put out uh, pamphlets in our, our little cul-de-sac. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to pamphlet and reach the whole area, so I'm doing my area. And uh, one of them came back. You know, one of my neighbors knows who I am and uh, decided they, they didn't want that, that pamphlet. I thought, y you know, that is really petty, isn't it? But you know what? It's not me they're bothered by. It's the gospel. That's right. And uh, that's just going to be the way it is. Uh, people won't always attack you or you know, hurt you physically, but it just offends some people. Uh, you know, the Bible talks here about how they receive the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Even the joy of the Holy Ghost will offend some people. <laughs> the fact that you're happy in the Lord, some people will find that real offensive. <laughs> Don't they know they should be miserable? <laughs> uh, I think it was about two weeks ago, th this thing with the, you know, the virus and all that in... In the United States, they, they appointed the vice president, Mike Pence, to head up a task force, you know, to whatever they're doing. Well, one of the things he did was he prayed with them. And they put, you know, that picture was in the paper, and some people were so offended. Oh, here's a guy, he's in charge of this, and he doesn't even believe in science. He thinks prayer is going to answer it. <laughs> Very offensive, isn't it? Uh, that's just the way it is, folks. If we're going to live for the Lord, don't think everybody's going to like you. If you want everybody to like you, you're in trouble. Because you're going to have to choose between pleasing the Lord and pleasing everyone else. And I'll guarantee you, you can't please everyone else. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Uh, we need to be people who are willing to please the Lord. Like we sang, though no one join me, still I'll follow. If they say they'll take your job, still I'll follow. If they say they'll take your life, still I'll follow. Uh, this was a suffering church, and uh, it wasn't just people looking mean at them. Uh, this was in days and, and places where uh, it, it was very, very real. The church that saved and surrendered will antagonize the world. 
The verse I was talking about earlier, 2 Timothy 3.12, you probably know it. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then he gives a real encouragement. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. <laughs> He's, he didn't say, oh, and it'll get better as we go along. He said, it's going to get worse. Man, you can just see it happening in, in our day and age. And it's amazing how quickly it happens. Uh, if things continue as they are, and I, I, I guess I say this too much, but um, what we believe will be illegal. And we will go to prison for it if we stand for it. Uh, this was a suffering church. Now, we don't want to be obnoxious. And I, I have to say, some Christians are. <laughs> uh, some, some people are Christians, and they're just obnoxious. You know? They're just not very nice to be around. That, that's not the point. We want to be like Jesus. Uh, we, we need to be careful we're not uh, you know, unkind or mean-spirited or, or, or cruel or any of those things. Jesus certainly wasn't. He was a gentleman. Uh, we want to be like Jesus. And being like Jesus is different than the world. And when we're different from the world, it's because we're separated unto the Lord. Uh, th that's the next point. This was a separated church. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that expression, but it, it's a common expression to talk about living a holy life, living for the Lord, separated. I, I guess the thing that comes to my mind is when the cream comes out of the milk, you know, they call it separating, and they take it out. Uh, it's different. And if, if you're going to be like Jesus, you're going to be different than the world. But let me tell you, you're the hope of the world. If you'll be like Jesus, they have someone that they can, they can see the light. They can, they can hear the truth. And, and people need that. People need the Lord. In verse 7, he says, you're in, in samples, you're examples. Verse 9, they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. People in their area worshipped idols. When they got saved, they no, no longer worshipped idols. That was a big difference. Some of you have experienced that. Um, it, just, it constantly amazes me how much alcohol is a part of everything in Australia. You have a baby christening, you got alcohol. You have a car race, well, you think uh, car races, they would not emphasize alcohol. When you get done and then you spray alcohol, you know, everything, it's alcohol. When you become saved and you say, oh, I, I don't drink, I, I won't have any of that. Oh, what? Man, they, they work and work and work to try and get you to drink, don't they? And one of the reasons is it makes them so uncomfortable to have somebody else doing what they really know is right. <laughs> uh, Misery loves com company. Well, so does sin. Uh, there's a difference when you trust Christ. This was a group of people who were different than the people around them. They were separated. And, and the thing is, we're not just trying to be different. There's a lot of people that are different. Uh, there's a girl I see at, at Bunnings. I, I really like her. But every time you see her, she got her hair a different color. Or the other day she had a pot plant growing out of her head or something. I don't know. And she's a lovely lady, but she just always wanted to be different, I guess. Uh, when I was a kid, the hippies, you know, they, they all wanted to be different. So they were all the same. <laughs> that didn't quite work out for them. But uh, as Christians, it's not just that we want to be different. It's that we want to be like Jesus. And the Bible says there in, uh, in verse 9, they turn to God from idols. There's a turning from, there's a turning to. And be careful that you're not just emphasizing the negative. That you're not just talking about, yeah, I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I don't do this, and I don't do that. Listen, emphasize what you do. Amen. You love the Lord. And we had a man in our church, somebody was encouraging him to be immoral in his vision, you know, what he was looking at. He said, no, no. He said, I value my marriage and, and my family too much. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and he made it a positive thing. He, he didn't want to lust after some other woman. He said, I, I value my marriage. And that's the way we need to be. Uh, turn from idols to God and uh, let God set your agenda is really what, what it comes down to. Not the people around you. Truth will contradict error. And if you feel like you're always different than everybody else, well, truth is going to be different than error. And the world will try and persuade you. Oh, live this way. And, and if 
I discovered something when I was, I must have been about a teenager. I realized that when I knew I was right, I didn't have to argue. Some of the biggest arguments you have is when you're not quite sure whether you're right or, or not. But I, somehow, the, the Lord taught me, uh, when, when you really know you're right, you don't, you just state your statement and let them say whatever they want. When you really know you're right. And, and as Christians, uh, we don't have to argue with everybody. We don't have to you know, give them a hard time. But truth will contradict error. Paul's example, look at uh, chapter 2, verse 10. He says, you are witnesses, and, and God also, how holily, there's a word you won't hear very much, <laughs> holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. That was Paul's example. He lived a godly life. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as the Father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Paul wasn't one of these who just... He said, you know, you live for the Lord, and he lived a dirty life. He was one who lived a holy life and said, and this is the way you should live. Uh, we need to be people that are, are separated. That was Paul's example. The next thing, verse 8, this was a soul-winning church. Did you notice he said, verse 8, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. I, I like that. That's a good way for it to be. You know, there's a lot of ways a church can be involved in soul-winning. A lot of it's just as individuals. We just talk to people when God gives us opportunity. Share a tract. Uh, you know, just somebody's talking about sin, well, tell them the remedy. <laughs> uh, we, we, we might as well sound it out. Um, there's things we do as a church where we can invite people and, and uh, you know, maybe we're having a dinner or maybe we're doing some activity and they can come and hear the gospel. Uh, we send missionaries. Somebody said the gospel is like, uh, like uh, ripples in a pond. You know, have you ever thrown a rock in the, in the pond and you know, it just moves out? Well, that's the way the gospel goes. We send out missionaries, and they send out missionaries, and they send out missionaries, and uh, you know, the gospel goes out. Uh, from them sounded out the word of the Lord. They, they lived the Christian life, but they also spoke the gospel. It's not enough just to live an example. We need to also be speaking the gospel. And, and like, like we said earlier, that's going to involve contention. If you've ever gone door knocking, there's some people who really resent it. Uh, there's others who are, are happy to talk to you. I find if you go door knocking, every once in a while you meet somebody who would talk to anybody. It wouldn't matter who they were. They're just lonely people. They want to talk to somebody. Well, that's all right. Uh, there's others who wouldn't talk to anybody. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2, uh, where we read earlier, uh, he said, How we suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. You know, going to Thessalonica didn't mean it was easy. Uh, there, was, there was trouble. Soul winning in, involves contention. We're in a battle. Let me show you a couple of verses from 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4, verse 11. I used this verse the other day, uh, or Wednesday, I guess it was. 1 Peter 4.11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God tells us, talk to people about the Lord. Serve the Lord. But then notice the next verse. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. Uh, we're in a battle. And uh, we need to realize that. You know, something else is true about the gospel. We've been given a trust. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. There's a couple of words I want you to notice. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. I want you to notice that word, allowed. <laughs> Sharing the gospel is not just a responsibility or an obligation or a burden. It's a blessing. We're allowed. 
the thing that came to my mind is this. If somebody had this amazing car, and they said, would you like to take it for a spin? You know, maybe a million dollar car, or, you know, whatever, compared to you know, whatever we drive. Would you like to take it for a spin? You're allowed. Well, that's, that's kind of what it's like to share the gospel with people. We're allowed to share the gospel. You know, God could have given that job to angels. He could have just done it. He could have done it a lot of different ways. But God chose us. We're allowed. And he says it's a trust. Do you understand a trust? It's when you're responsible for somebody else's possession. If you have a trust for your children, it means that money is, is supposed to be there. You, you can't spend it. <laughs> and uh, the trust we have uh, as Christians is the gospel. We're to do with it as the owner says. Uh, it's a blessing. We get to take the king's message. And it involves our very soul. This is not just a cut and dried kind of thing. <clears throat> you know, I'll say the words and that kind of. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 8 he says, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you are dear unto us. So when we're able to share the gospel with people, we're investing our souls. We're investing our hearts. We're extending ourselves. We're putting ourselves out there willing to be damaged, willing to be persecuted for the gospel. It's a commitment from our soul to theirs. And I'll guarantee you, if people trust Christ, they'll thank you. <laughs> they'll be glad you shared the gospel with them. There's others who won't be. But this was a soul-winning church, and it's, it's such a blessing that God allows us to do that. The last one this morning, this evening, in verse 10, this was a, this was a second coming church. They, they turned to God from idols. They were serving the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. This was a characteristic that made them different than other people. Uh, they were a church looking for Christ's second coming. It's in this book that he talks about how he's delivered us from the wrath to come. And as Christians, we need to understand, uh, there is coming a day of judgment. But God has delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, I know there's, there's lots of things being said nowadays about the rapture. But listen, I, I believe, and I believe the Bible teaches, the next event on God's calendar is the rapture. God is going to snatch us away, and, and then the, the tribulation will start. We'll, we'll be looking at that more in, in detail in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And the, the, the difference between the rapture and the second coming is, at the rapture, we meet the Lord in the air. At the second coming, we come with him. And he puts his foot on the earth and splits things wide open. Man, things, things really, uh, there's a big difference between the two. And uh, we know the time is near. I was sharing the verse with you earlier. I shared it with someone else today. How men's hearts are failing them for fear. Well, listen, during the time of the tribulation, uh, that's exactly what's going to be happening. Um, but as Christians, no matter what's going on around us, our redemption draws nigh. That we're looking for Jesus to come again. And it gives us hope. We, we're not waiting in dread. We're waiting in expectation. Uh, we're looking uh, for the coming of the Lord. Uh, in 1 John, God says in 1 John chapter 3 and, and verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. It gives us hope. Uh, we know that Jesus is coming again. And it also gives us motivation. The next verse in 1 John, Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Uh, when you were a kid, you know, and the teacher left the room, and you're messing around, and then somebody said, the teacher's coming. Oh, boy, you straightened up, didn't you? You got all the desks back in order. I remember one time the teacher left, and we were playing bumper cars with the, with the desks. <laughs> You know, you didn't know your pastor did those kind of things, but, uh, you know, I was only 12. Uh, and all of a sudden, the teacher's coming. Man, everything's in order, and boy, we just look like little, little saints, you know. Well, Jesus is coming. And we need to be careful that we're not careless, that we don't just take a day as, as nothing. It's another opportunity. 
Uh, Jesus is coming again. We look expectantly. We look in hope. Uh, we're looking for Jesus. He gives us motivation to be godly. He gives us motivation to reach others. You know, th there's, uh, there's going to come a time when we're, we're snatched out of here and people are left behind. Uh, people need to know the Lord. Uh, there's, there's so much that you can, you can see that we need to be uh, honoring in, in God's economy. Uh, we need to be a, a saved church. We need to be people who know the Lord. We need to be a scriptural church. Uh, God's word is, is the, the value to us. We need to be a spirit-filled church. Uh, God's Holy Spirit using the word of God. We need to be a surrendered church. People who are willing to be what Jesus wants us to be. Uh, we may be a suffering church. Uh, we should be a separated church. One that's uh, willing to uh, live for the Lord and have a standard of righteousness, whether the world approves or not. We need to be a soul-winning church and a, a church that's looking for Jesus uh, to come again. You know, the key to all of this, I believe, is have you received the word? And he said of that, that church that they received the word of God, not as the word of men, but the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now, for it to work, you got to believe it. Don't wait for it to work and then believe. For it to work, you got to believe it. And a, a person has to come to Christ. Have you turned to God from idols? Several times God tells us, children, don't have idols. Have you turned to God? God is still in the life-changing business today. They said in Thessalonica, those that turn the world upside down have come here too. God is still turning the world upside down. Uh, the world will say, oh, listen, you're upside down. Well, listen, God will tell us which one of us are upside down. And uh, we need to be willing to follow the Lord. Let me encourage you tonight. Take this example to heart. Uh, I, I, I've enjoyed the service tonight. I enjoyed, you know, the testimonies and you know, all the things that go on. I love this church. And, uh, you know, God has, has blessed us, given us opportunity. Uh, but let's use the opportunities that we have. Let's love each other. Let's try and reach out to people. Let's be the best uh, Christian that we can be in this church. Uh, if we're going to argue, let's argue over who gets to do the, the next service for the Lord, you know, uh, the next chance to, to be a blessing to someone. Uh, God, God wants to use us, and uh, we can have a, a testimony like this church in, in Thessalonica. Let's go to him in, in prayer this evening. I don't know, maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart about his will, and maybe about one of these areas, and uh, you can certainly submit yourself to him and uh, yield to his control. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Lord, we're thankful for the testimony of these folks who turned to you from idols and uh, served you and sounded out the word and believed it and lived it. Lord, help us to have a good testimony in our community. Uh, Lord, forgive us where we've, we've failed in these areas, but uh, Lord, help us to be the salt and light and, and the testimony for you that you want us to be. Lord, I pray for those in our church that are struggling within themselves and help them to yield to your control. Father, help us to be a blessing to each other. Father, you've given us uh, many visitors in the last months. Help us to reach out to them and, and to be a blessing. Help us to share your word and share our, our homes and hospitality with them. Uh, Father, uh, help us as a church. Help us as individuals and families. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.